1967, I was a 20-year-old student at the United States Merchant Marine Academy in Kings Point, New York. And in 1967, I was standing right on this road here, hitchhiking all the way to Montreal, Canada, to Expo 67, the World's Fair on the Future. But I was going to see one person in particular. It was the geodesic dome, the U.S. Pavilion in 1967, designed by a man named Dr. R. Buckminster Fuller. It was a different time, and that was me in 1967, on my way to meet the man who could see the future. was a futurist, and he's one of the first person to systematically define how you and I can see the future. So that really intrigued me, <laughs> because if I could see the future, I could see the future of stock markets, bond markets, real estate markets, and all that. And I, so I had a very small reason to want to be a futurist. It's all about greed to make money. So then in 1981, I had the opportunity to study with Dr. Fuller. Uh, up in Kirkwood, California, which is near Lake Tahoe. And I spent a week with him up there, and I realized he wasn't looking at the future of the stock market. He was looking at the future of humanity. But the people running our economy, running the world, running our banks, running our politics, have us on a collision course with disaster. So, so I went, and once I could see the future, I knew I had to make changes. I was in rock and roll, you know, I, was, I had bands like Van Halen, Boy George, Duran Duran, The Police, and I was having fun, and it was sex, drugs, rock and roll, and I was in my 30s. I thought it was hot, my freight life, you know. Then I made Fuller, and then I changed. You know, there's more to my life than just making money and selling hats, wallets, bags, t-shirts, and you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll. And, uh, so after 1981, I started studying with him more earnestly. I studied his books more, especially his book, Critical Path. I started applying with Fuller's teachings on how to predict the future to the markets, because that's my interest. That's, that's my rich dad and Bucky Fuller. That's where they come in line. They say the same thing. The markets are manipulated. In 1969, I graduated from Kings Point and joined the U.S. Marine Corps and was selected for pilot training in Pensacola, Florida. In 1972, I was flying helicopter gunships in Vietnam. Also in 1972, my rich dad sent me a letter saying that President Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard in 1971. He said, be careful, the world was about to change. So in 1971, was when our wealth began to be stolen. Since 1981, I had the privilege, the good fortune, to study with Dr. Fuller three times. And then when he passed away on July 1st, 1983, I really felt a complete loss. Yet a responsibility to pass on the knowledge and wisdom he had taught me in my class. So after 1983, <laughs> I began to make predictions. And, you know, making predictions is very risky because you sound like an idiot. And in many ways, I sounded like Chicken Little saying, you know, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And if you look at what's happening in the world economy today, for millions of people, the sky is falling. So in 2002, I published this book here called Rich Dad's Prophecy. Again, it was 2002, 
And what this book predicted was a giant crash coming in 2016. So 14 years ahead of schedule, I was making this prediction. But I also made one intermediate pr prediction behind that was that there would be a secondary crash before the giant crash of 2016. So this is me on CNN with Wolf Blitzer risking, looking like a complete idiot, making a prediction on the coming crash. If people start pulling out of the markets in their 50s, in their early 60s, and not having that sort of exposure, we are never gonna get to a point where our money lasts as long as we need it to. We need to be participants in this system into our 70s and into our 80s, and then we need a plan for withdrawing those assets just like we needed a plan for putting those assets in. Yes, and you're putting those assets into those investment bankers that are in financial trouble today. And I'm all all I'm saying is, aren't these guys supposed to be the smartest guys on earth? And shouldn't we be careful who we take financial advice from, including the four of us on this panel? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And that's what I'm saying. There's a lot of bad advice. But Robert, out there. you're really that worried about Goldman Sachs and, and Lehman Brothers? Yes. I'm afraid the Federal Reserve will eventually or come close to bailing them out. That's what I'm concerned about. And that young lady who says the taxpayer is not in trouble. Who's going to pay for that bailout again as the taxpayer? Lehman Brothers says it plans to file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. The collapse of Lehman Brothers. Bank Lehman Brothers collapsed. Hundreds of bailed out banks are still struggling to repay taxpayers. Way back in 1997, I published this book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I said three things that got me in a lot of trouble. One was that the rich don't work for money. Number two is your house is not an asset. And number three, savers would be losers. So that was in 1997. And look at what happened in 2007. The real estate market crashed. The government started printing money called quantitative easing and savers became losers. It's no secret that the California housing bubble has popped with hardships spread wide. Real estate expert Robert Kiyosaki predicted all of this would happen back in 2005, but most people didn't listen. It's the biggest financial bubble in the history of the world. Hoping this wasn't inevitable, but we have had a big jump in foreclosure filings. Let me tell you a little about this. There are 650,000 homes in the United States in foreclosure right now. U.S. foreclosure activity jumped 81% in 2008. With 10 million people lost their homes to foreclosure and were forced out onto the streets. And to this day, millions of people are still underwater they owe more on their house than their house is worth. You want to know what real estate's going to do? Look at jobs. Right. We correct. still have a bad job situation. So right. it's still a bad real estate situation. Right. Real estate is only as valuable as there's jobs. What made you write Conspiracy of the Rich? It goes back to why don't we have financial education in our schools? Question, was the financial crisis a creation of a wicked conspiracy, a new online book? Conspiracy of the Rich, The Eight New Rules of Money, exposes what author Robert Kiyosaki says is a twisted tale of how the rich control the world economy through, you name it, the Fed, Wall Street, your schools, and the government that supports these entities. Robert Kiyosaki is the author of the best-selling Rich Dad, Poor Dad series. His first book in the series has held a top spot on the New York Times bestseller list for six years running. And he joins us on the program today. Hello, Robert. What is this conspiracy theory? You mean it's a few people at the top handling all of us like puppets on a string? Say it isn't so. Well, I wish it wasn't so, but um, I've been a student of this crisis since around 1983, and I could see it coming back in 1983. People that are following the old rules, such as work hard, save money, get out of debt, live below your means, and invest in a well-diversified portfolio of mutual funds, you're getting wiped out. So all coins have three sides. There is no such thing as a one-sided coin. See, all coins have heads on one side and tails on the other side, and the third side is the edge. So in real life, there'll always be people who say you're right, other people who say you're wrong. There's other people who are saying that we should be Republican or you can be a Democrat. See, the intelligent thing to do is stand on the edge. You see, intelligence 
is found on the edge. The moment you take a side, you say one side is right and the other side is wrong, you become an idiot. And in today's world, we have the battle between the capitalist and the socialist. I say both sides are right, but the most important thing to do is which side is best for you. So stand on the edge, be intelligent, and look at heads and tails. The test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. F. Scott Fitzgerald. On July 1st, 1983, I was driving down the highway in Honolulu, Hawaii, and it came over the radio, uh, futurist and genius Buckminster Fuller passed away today. And this overwhelming sense of, I had to pull over to the side of the road, all these cars whizzing by and just crying. I've mentioned the, uh, the Windstar Project, and one of the gentlemen who's involved in the Windstar Project is named Buckminster Fuller. He's a very, very dear friend of mine. I consider the genius of our times. And uh, this is a song that I wrote for Bucky that's part of the new album that I'm out in L.A. recording. I suppose that there are those who say he had it easy. Had it made, in fact, before you know, because he, he was what they call the, the grandfather of the future. You know, John Denver, Paul he was our hope that he was going to bring about a better world. And so when he died, you know, the question goes, well, who's going to replace him? And thank God I always remember what Fuller said. He says, in 1927, when he was a complete screw-up, you know, he's lost his businesses and all this, so he says, what can I do? I'm just a little guy. So as I'm sitting on the side of the road, you know, just mourning the loss of uh, what I thought was the man who was going to lead us out of this mess we're in, I realized he was not there anymore. And I had to ask myself, what can I do? I'm just a little guy. What one man can and in 84, I sold my businesses, quit my job, met this beautiful what woman named Kim, and my friend Blair Singh and I, now our rich dad advisors. We all held hands and we took a leap of faith. One man went in and said, I don't know what we can do, but we have to do something. And we were broke for years. But we just kept teaching and talking to people what Fuller says and teaching the same things my rich dad taught me of how you never need a paycheck again and how you find financial freedom versus job security. That's how strong his love for you and me. A friend to all the universe, grandfather of the future, and everything that I would like to be. In 1983, after Fuller passed away, and I read his book, Grunch of Giants, Grunch standing for Gross Universal Cash Heist, I understood what both men were saying. Our wealth is being stolen via our money system. Is change the world and make it new again. Don't you see what one man can do? So the thing I'm upset about is our school system doesn't teach us anything about money and how the ultra rich are manipulating the system via printing money. They're ripping us off for our money system. So that's why, as I said, there's three sides to a coin. You gotta decide which side you're on. You wanna be on the poor and middle class side? Knock yourself out, have a good time. Work hard, pay taxes and lose money. I want it to be on this side of the coin. The riskier side is the poor middle class because the state of the economy today, they're gonna keep printing, 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 printing. We cannot survive this thing. The, the central banks will just keep printing money. And that's good for me because I'm gonna make more money, but every time you print money, the poor and middle class get poorer. So that's why I wrote Second Chance. You have to decide where you wanna be, you know? I made my decision years ago. I don't want to be on the poor and middle class side. I want to be on the rich side. But I also found the social responsibility to let everybody know the whole picture. Fuller was not only a futurist, he was a scientist, a mathematician, uh, some, call, some call an architect. 
He was asked to leave Harvard not once, but twice, which kind of, so he never really finished school. He was a genius, but he was hard to define simply because he was a, he was a genius at so many different subjects. In 1983, after reading his book, Grunch of Giants, posthumously, after he, was, after he had passed away, I was surprised because Grunch of Giants was not about math, science, it was about the economy. It was about the future of the economy. And that's when I realized Bucky Fuller and my rich dad, who was my best friend's father, had been saying the same things for years. After reading Grunch of Giants, which stands for Gross Universal Cash Heist, how we are being ripped off by the very thing we work for, money, I began doing my own research on what both men had been saying. See, up to then, I was a proverbial C- minus student. I only studied just to take a test. I only studied what I was told to study. I take the test and forget about it. But after reading Grunch of Giants and hearing what Bucky said about the future and the economy and what my rich dad had been telling me for years, I became a student for the very first time. I went all the way back, not just taking their word for it, but finding out my own answers. I wrote Second Chance because there's a lot of confusion about this global economic crisis. You know, one side of the coin, especially the politicians, say, hey, don't worry, everything's fine, the economy's coming back. On the other side of the coin, there's people who say, we're on the eve of destruction. You know, buy guns, store food, buy gold, and go into hiding. And on one side of the coin, the socialists say, we need more entitlement programs. We need to take care of people. And capitalists say, if we keep giving people money, we're all gonna go broke. And today, finally, everybody knows America is deeply in debt. We all know the US is in debt, and this is the chart of the national debt of the United States, somewhere over 17 trillion. And for some people that's scary, but what's coming up next, to me, is terrifying. Our leaders have shut down the US government and continually threaten to shut down the US government because America is broke. We're out of money. And all this does is scare people and confuse people. People do not know what to do. And so that's why I wrote Second Chance. I wrote Second Chance as simply as possible. You know that principle, KISS? Keep it super simple. So Second Chance is written very, very simply. There's another saying that goes, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So instead of using a lot of economic terms and financial terms that confuse people, I did my best to use the simplest charts possible, charts and graphs, so you can look at it. Just look at the pictures and you come to your own conclusion, which way is this economy going? Are we going up or are we gonna go down? I left it up to you to decide whether things are good or bad. The great thing about Second Chance and all the pictures in it, a 10-year-old child can look at the pictures. If they do nothing else, just look at the pictures. They go, oh my God, is that what's going on? And then you as a family, hopefully one of you has read the book, can discuss further what the charts and graphs mean. The following are examples of some of the charts you'll find in Second Chance. Remember a picture is worth a thousand words. But this first graph is a picture of the purchasing power of the US dollar. You know, people say there's inflation. There really isn't inflation. What's really happening is the purchasing power of the dollar is going down. This makes life harder and harder on those who work for money. So in other words, the US dollar is worth less and less and less. The more the government prints money, the more worthless the US dollar becomes. The, the government says they won the war on poverty. Well, this chart says differently. Because the US is printing money, what you find out, it's harder and harder for the poor and lower middle class to earn what's called a living wage. In other words, they can't afford to live, they can't afford a house, they can't afford food, they can't afford transportation. And what this chart shows here is the increased use of food stamps. So while our government says poverty is going down, the reality is that use of food stamps is going up. This means the average American cannot afford to live. And add to this, high income jobs are being outsourced to countries like China and Pakistan and India. So this is another reason for this next chart here. You'll see that the middle class in America is not growing. What this chart shows you is the middle class is shrinking. 
So to keep up with this global changes, millions, young as well as old, are going back to school for retraining, hoping to find that high paying job. Unfortunately, these two charts tell a different story. The first chart here is you see the rising cost of a college education. And as you know, millions of people leave school, both young and old, saddled for a lifetime with student loan debt, the worst possible debt of all. Student loan debt is worse than a mortgage, credit card debt, or a car loan. Simply said, student loan debt is debt for life. That is inhumane. How dare we saddle our students with debt for the rest of their lives? It's criminal. So education is more important than ever before, but look at what happens to college graduates. Instead of their wages going up, this chart shows you that their wages are actually coming down. And even worse than all that, you graduate and you learn nothing about money. I mean, the question is, why would you go to school to make less money, come out of school deeply in debt and learn nothing about money? Doesn't make sense to me. And this chart really concerns me. This is the chart on Social Security. If you look at this chart, you notice just around 2012, the Social Security Trust Fund goes bankrupt. It starts operating in the red. Simultaneously in 2012, 10,000 baby boomers turn 65 every single day just as the fund goes broke. How are we going to pay for this? You know, what's going to happen to these old guys? What's going to happen to my generation, the baby boomers? Will the baby boomers, the most affluent generation in history, soon become the baby busters? I'm concerned about my own generation. Worst of all, how are we going to pay for these old guys like me? You know, Medicare goes up, expenses go up. You know, life doesn't get cheaper when you get old. You know, they, it is estimated that Social Security, Medicare, and other entitlement programs is an off-balance sheet debt of $100 trillion to $250 trillion. Most people do not know how big that debt is. How are we going to pay for this? Print more money? Who is going to pay for this? You? Your kids? Your kids' grandkids? Who is going to pay for this? Are we just going to print more money? And this leads to the next thing that really concerns me. These next two charts shows you what happens when a country prints too much money. Again, as Bucky taught me, to see the future, look at the past. And what you see here is a chart of the German Weimar government between the years 1918 and 1923. The German government, to pay its bills, began printing and printing and printing and printing. So the German economy looked good because the economy was growing with all this printed money. But what happened was it eventually collapsed after 1923. What happened was this, if you were a millionaire in Germany prior to 1918, by 1923, you were a pauper. I'm afraid that's what's gonna to happen to millions across the world if the United States keeps printing money. So here's a chart of the United States today. It's called quantitative easing, and it just keeps going up. The reason they call it quantitative easing, that's simply government speak, government jargon, a way of keeping us confused. Quantitative easing, simply means printing money. Notice the similarity between Germany between 1918 and 1923 and the United States today. And so we, here we are in 2015. And let me tell you, it's spooky. It's a long way down. And when I look back, you know, at the giant crash of 1929, it's very small. So the question I ask you, which way is the economy going? Hopefully, my rich dad and Bucky Fuller are wrong, that the stock market will keep going up. Looking for a savior, the German people elected Adolf Hitler Chancellor of all Germany in 1933. After taking control of Germany, Hitler is quoted as saying, what luck for the rulers when men do not think. Same thing is going on in America today. That's why there's no financial education in our school, and that's why our government can get away with what it's doing. I see similarities between then and now, do you? And that's why I wrote Second Chance, because it's time we start to think.
as I said in part one, in 1971, President Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard, and the dollar became debt, and the U.S. could now print money. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets. The problem is our education system never changed after 1971. You see what low grade you made on your weekly mathematics test. More than half of you failed. Most of those who passed just got by. Nobody had 100%. And now we have this gap between the rich and everybody else. And this is dangerous. The gap between the rich, poor, and middle class is too wide. And for the first time, the American dream is disappearing. Instead of the American dream, where everybody become rich, many people in America and throughout the world are angry at the rich. You know, today some politicians are saying, look at the gap between CEO pay and employee pay. Well, that is the American dream to get rich. Do you get angry at the Kardashians for making a million? Do you get angry at sports stars for making a million? Do you get angry at rock stars for becoming rich? Look, if you're going to get angry at somebody, get angry at our school system. Look, this is not an economic crisis. This is a crisis in education, which is why I always ask, why is there no financial education in schools? That's where the gap is caused. You can't give people money and expect the gap to get closer. That's crazy. So this next section, you will find out from me, if I ran the schools, this is what financial education would look like. So now we're in part three of Second Chance, and part three is about what is financial education? Because you see, education also comes in three sides. On one side, you have traditional education, and on the other side, you have financial education. And our job is to stand on the edge and figure out what's best for you and me. I mean, what are you gonna do about the financial crisis? Are you going back to traditional education or is your second chance found in financial education? So traditional education is like my poor dad's education, which is go to school, you get a job and become an employee you save money, you work hard, you get out of debt, you buy a house, and you invest for the long term in the stock market. And that's traditional education. And on the financial education side, which is my rich dad side, it's opposite. And that's what makes it hard for most people because it's opposite. On rich dad side, it's become an entrepreneur, somebody who hires employees, you understand debt because debt makes the rich richer. You have to understand taxes because taxes make the rich richer. And also you must understand markets. Yes, you must be able to make money when markets are going up and markets are going down. See, my concern is if there is this large crash coming, if markets come down, it's going to wipe out these guys on the traditional education side. So the question for you is which side is best for you? For your second chance, is your second chance going to be found going back to school, traditional school, and getting a high paying job, or being on the financial education side and learning to have money work for you, which is best for you? So actually, financial education can be pretty easy. My financial education began when I was just nine years old. It was when my rich dad, who was my best friend's father, he would teach his son and I about money playing the game of Monopoly. And we all know the great formula for Monopoly. It's four greenhouses, one red hotel. So I would play Rich Dad, his son and me, we would play Monopoly all day long and then I'd go home. The difference was my Rich Dad was kind of talking to us, teaching us, teaching us to think like rich people. He was like a teacher, a coach, and a mentor as we played Monopoly. And then I'd go home to my poor dad and he'd say, what you been doing all day? You know, I'd say, well, I've been playing Monopoly. Ah, what a waste of time. Go and do your homework. Because if you don't do your homework, you won't get good grades and you won't get a good job. So that's where my financial education began. See, my poor dad is a great man. He graduated from the University of Hawaii in less than two years. He went on to Stanford, University of Chicago, and Northwestern, ultimately getting a PhD and becoming the head of education for the state of Hawaii. 
So he was academically smart, but he had no financial education. On my rich dad's side, my rich dad never finished school, but he understood how to play the game of Monopoly. So he taught his son and me starting at age nine, and we played that game probably a thousand times over the years. We played it until I was in my 30s with Rich Dad. And today, what I do, and my wife does, is we play Monopoly in real life. So this is my question to you. For your second chance, is it time for you to start playing Monopoly in real life? So behind me is the cash flow quadrant. It is book number two in the Rich Dad series. And the cash flow quadrant is a very important book. And again, you're going to find out things are opposite. See, on one side of the quadrant, you have E and you have S. This is my poor dad side. E stands for employee. S stands for self-employed, small business, specialty, a specialist or a star, like a you know a movie star or golf pro. So we have E's and S's on one side, and on my rich dad's side, you have B's, which stands for big business. These are the guys like Henry Ford, Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs, you know Bill Gates, and I stands for investor, but just not any investor. This stands for professional investor. See, most people who invest on the E and the S side. They invest in 401ks, they invest in IRAs and Roth IRAs. These guys are passive investors. When we talk about investor, we're talking about proactive, professional investors. So on this side is my poor dad side, E's and S's, and on this side are B's and I's, and this is my rich dad. So when I was a young man, I had to decide which side was best for me, E or S, B or I. So this is a very important subject now, it's called taxes. Now most people hate paying taxes. So let me ask you this question. You have E's, S's, B's, and I's. Who pays the most taxes? Okay, so on the E's, and this is true throughout the world, it's about 40%. So if you're an employee, a major part of your paycheck goes to pay taxes, and that's how your wealth is being stolen. If you're an S, which is self-employed, movie star, or a specialist like an accountant, attorney, or a doctor, you pay 60% and higher. So the E's and S's pay the highest taxes possible, and these are the people who went to school and they're told to work hard for money. On the B and I side, which is the rich, the B's pay 20% in taxes. They pay much less, and the I's, the professional investor, pays as little as 0% in taxes. So some of you are saying, this is not fair. And I can understand that because most people are on this side looking at this side. But let me just say this to you. Tax laws are fair. You see, tax laws don't care if you're rich or poor. You can be rich or poor and still pay zero taxes. You can pay, be rich or poor and pay 20% in taxes. See, what is not fair is the lack of financial education in our schools so these people on this side have no idea how these guys are making a much more money and paying a lot less in taxes. So let me just say this. For those of you who have read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, or if you haven't, look at Rich Dad, Poor Dad one more time. Lesson number one from my Rich Dad was this. The rich do not work for money. See, these guys here on the A and the S side, they work very hard for money and they pay the highest taxes. What Rich Dad said on the B side, you should have people work for you, so you pay less taxes. And the I side, your money works hard for you. Other people's money works hard for you, so that's why you pay less in taxes. And that's what financial education in should include. You must know the difference between why some people pay a lot of taxes and why others pay very little. So my question for you is this, which side of the quadrant is best for you for your second chance? Second Chance is an in-depth learning package, primarily for people who want to know more about the B side and the I side. And if you see this bug back here, this is called the Rich Dad Radio Bug, because you know you are who you hang out with. 
you know, if you're an idiot, you hang out with idiots. And if you're a crook, you hang out with crooks. And if you're a rich person, you hang out with rich people. So the Rich Dad Radio bug here means you can learn more if you want to learn more from people who are really doing the real thing. You see, the reason most people struggle financially is they take financial advice from salespeople. They're called, you know, stockbrokers, real estate brokers, and insurance brokers or financial planners. As my rich dad said, the reason they're called brokers is because they're broker than you. They need your money. So when you see this bug here, it's called the Rich Dad Radio, and it's in Second Chance, and you can listen in. You can drop in on conversations between really successful so-called rich people who are doing the real thing on the B and the I side. For example, if you want to learn more about how the rich pay less in taxes, the Rich Dad Radio Bug has a conversation with my tax advisor, Tom Wheelwright. If you want to learn how debt makes the investor richer, listen in on that conversation. They're about 45 minutes long. They're, you know, they're just great information packets. You just drop in and listen to what rich people are really saying. And for those of you who have young people, we have my friends Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Trump, sons of Donald Trump the Great, and they talk about how their dad did not spoil them, but trained them to be entrepreneurs, not employees. So this Rich Dad Radio bug is part of your in-depth learning package included in the book Second Chance. Remember, you are who you hang out with. Birds of a feather do flock together. So in 1994, Kim was financially free. And she was only 37 years old, and I was 47 years old. So people kept asking us, how did you guys do it? And so we told them we just played Monopoly in real life, but that didn't satisfy them. So by 1996, Kim and I developed the cash flow board game, as you see behind here. And many people say the cash flow board game is Monopoly on steroids. As I said, I, my financial education began when I was nine, playing Monopoly with my rich dad. So let me give you some of the opposites that found on the cash flow board game. This is one big opposite. In the middle of the game, you see this thing called the rat race? That's where most E's and S's wind up. They go to school, they get a job, or they become a doctor or a lawyer, and they wind up in that rat race, you know, working really hard, paying a lot of taxes, giving their money to the government, giving the money to Wall Street via their 401k or IRA, and they just spin that little rat race. But that's not what the rich do. So those on the B and the I side, they invest in what's called the fast track. Again, everything is opposite. You can either run your life inside the little rat race, or you can be a B and the I on the fast track. Everything is opposite. There are a number of other things that make the cash flow board game monopoly on steroids. One big reason is cash flow is the only game that encourages you to use debt to become rich. Now I know some of you are going, oh, I'm so afraid of debt. And you should be, because you have to learn how to use it. Debt is dangerous, if not well used. So cash flow actually encourages you to use debt, but this is the best thing. You use debt with play money. If you make a mistake, it's only play money. Try doing that in real life. You make a bad mistake with debt, and you're wiped out. This is the most important part of the cash flow game. The cash flow game, again, Monopoly on steroids, is the only game that teaches you to use a financial statement. Now, 99.9% .9 of all kids leaving high school, have no idea what a financial statement is. Can you imagine that? You see, on my poor dad's side, the E and the S side, my poor dad says, oh, you have to have good grades. So when you're in school, your report card is A, B, C, D, S, and F. So my rich dad on this side said, on the B and the I side, your report card is called a financial statement. So many people leave school thinking their report card is the most important thing. With that, a 4.0 or 2.0, who cares? What really counts is your financial statement. Now, if I was to grade our political leaders on their financial intelligence, I would give them an F. That's all the politicians from the president on down, they should be fired for running the economy into the ground. And what about all the bankers who really cheated a lot of people? 
they should get an F. You know, they're the people that actually tell you to invest for the long term in savings and in the mutual funds. They should get an F for bad information. And what about the school system? Now, I'm not blaming the teachers, but the academic system of America, if they have a financial report card, I'd give them an F also because they're failing to educate people and prepare young people for the real world. Remember, the banker wants to see your financial statement. But the people on this side, they're still living in the past. Oh, I'm an A student, you know, I have a 4.0 average. Well, your banker doesn't care. Your banker wants to see your financial statement because your financial statement is your report card when you leave school. But if 99% of high school kids have no idea what a financial statement is, no wonder we're in economic trouble. A couple more things. When you look at the financial statement, you'll see over here it says income. E's and S's always want, oh, I want a high paying job. I want a high paying job. They want income. What makes the rich richer is they focus on the asset column. It's the asset column that makes the rich richer. So the beauty of playing the cash flow game as many times as possible, it's like the fundamentals. It's training you to think like a rich person and think about acquiring assets, not high paying job, which are taxed. So this is some of the most important things about the cash flow game is your focus will be on assets, not income and it'll train you to think like a rich person, not a poor middle class person who wants a high paying job. So this is the power found inside the cash flow game. We just, Kim and I designed this game in 1996 to have people teach people. I'm telling you, this works. This is what Kim and I did to retire in less than 10 years because we focus on assets, not a high paying job. And the cash flow game can do the same thing for you to train you to think like a rich person, not like a poor middle class person looking for a high paying job. For those of you who are considering a second chance in the B quadrant or the I quadrant, I'd like to introduce you to my sweetheart Kim because the B quadrant and I quadrant is not for everybody. But this is my sweetheart. The smartest decision I've ever made was um, <clears throat> You know, getting married to Kim is a blessing almost 30 years now. Almost right? 30 years. And uh, when I met Kim, she was an employee in an advertising agency. But what I was most impressed was in, you were going for the B quadrant. Yes. And you had a little network marketing business. Yeah, I, I, knew, I knew very early on I did not want to be an employee. I didn't really know what the options were. Um, because I was always around employees growing up, but I got introduced to network marketing while I was working in advertising, and I thought this would be a good idea for me to start to learn what it is to be a business owner. So I, I got set up with this network marketing company, I was representative, and it was a great, great, great learning experience for me and to what it takes to be an entrepreneur because if I didn't make the sale, I didn't get any money. And I had to get very creative on how I was gonna sell because of course, like most network marketing, you go to your family and friends and that runs out pretty fast. So then you've gotta go find new customers. So I would set up my little salons at fitness clubs and different places throughout Honolulu and, and I would continue to sell. And I'd also learn how to sell and what worked and what didn't work but it was probably one of the best business trainings I could have had early on. And you had to teach other people how to sell in a exactly. role Exactly, yep, you had to teach others, you had to learn about leadership. So network marketing for me was a great way for me to discover if I wanted to become an entrepreneur. And so when I met her 30 something years ago, I said, man, she's got beauty, she's got brains, and she loves business. I do love business. And we've become business partners for 30 years now. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here without her today. And she and I developed the cash flow board game. For those of you who want to find out if you want to be a professional investor versus a passive investor, if you're tired of 401ks and IRAs and Roths and all that other stuff, that's where we developed the cash flow game for. Yes, and so we developed the cash flow board game basically to teach people what it was Robert and I did to become financially free. Yes, yeah, so we recommend network marketing if you want to move into the B quadrant. And for those interested in becoming professional investors, check out the cash flow board game. So I actually have a business degree, a college degree in business, but I have to say, getting into network marketing, I learned more about what it takes to be an entrepreneur than I ever learned in my four years of college. So once again, education is more important than before, but as you can see, there's different types of education. 
There's traditional education on one side and financial education on the other side. Well, the same is true with learning. There's more than one side. And back in 1969, educational psychologist, Dr. Edward Dale, again in 1969, created this thing here called the cone of learning. And on the cone of learning, you'll find out there's more than one way to learn. When we look at the bottom of the cone here, what you'll find there's two ways of learning. There's reading and then listening to words or listening to lecture. This is my poor dad's way of learning. To me as a kid, it was boring, boring, boring. At the other end of the cone of learning, you'll find the best way to learn is to do the real thing, but just below that is a thing called simulation. Simulation is another word for games or practice or simulating doing the real thing. So at the top of the cone was the way my rich dad taught me, at the bottom of the cone is where traditional education or my poor dad tried to teach me. So what Edgar Dale, again, Dr. Dale in 1969, educational psychologist found out that reading, you retain the least, less than 10%. And then when you listen to lecture, it's about 20%. So that's why in school, so much of the time is I would attend class and listen to a lecture and forget everything. So once again, it's more than two ways to learn. At the bottom, you know, these are the A students. And a lot of times at the top, these are the C students or D students. How many have met people who are really smart in school, but they can't do the real thing? You know, and that's one of the problems I had with traditional education. They give you all the answers, but these people aren't that bright. You know, they don't know what to do. They can't do much. They're afraid of making mistakes. So that's the bottom of the learning curve that Edgar Dale, Dr. Edgar Dale found out and the top. Now you move up to the next level. The next level is looking at pictures. And one of the reasons I did second chance in so many pictures is to improve your retention, to improve your learning, and that's up to about 30%. Now moving above that is you watch a movie. And this video, this movie called The Man Who Could Predict the Future is again, we did it just to increase your retention so you remember more and forget less. So moving up the cone of learning, you hear you have this thing called participating in a discussion. And that's really high up there. And the reason we have Rich Dad Radio, the bug, you know, so you can go inside Second Chance, is you can participate by dropping in and listening to discussions from real people who are doing what they talk about, who know what they're talking about. And up at 90% is a thing called simulation. And that's where games come from. The reason I learned so much from my rich dad was because my rich dad used a game of Monopoly. You know, four greenhouses, one red hotel. I retained a lot, I learned a lot. And then rich dad would coach me and talk to me and educate me about how to do the real thing. So that I hear many people say, oh, oh, it's so risky. What you do is so risky. Oftentimes those are the people who are like my poor dad. They did well in school, a lot of times A students many times accountants and attorneys and doctors, but they've only learned how to learn from reading and from lecture. And when it comes up to this level here, which is practice, practice in the simulation, playing the game, and then doing the real thing, then they say it's risky. And it is risky if you've been taught not to simulate, not to practice. You see, the way we as humans are designed to learn is by making mistakes. For example, a baby learns to walk by standing up, falling down, standing up, falling down. Then after they learn how to walk, then they learn to run, then they get on a bicycle, and again, they fall off, stand up, fall off, and then they learn how to ride. But our school system, especially down at the base level here, the reading and lecture, is if you make a mistake, they punish you. They always punish you for making a mistake. That's why so many of these really smart people can't do anything because this is what Edgar Dale is talking about. It's simulation and then doing the real thing. So what I suggest is you read this book, listen to some of the lectures, watch this video in the entirety, discuss it, participate in it, listen to what the experts are saying, and then you may want to play either Monopoly or the game Cash Flow and play it and play it and play it again until it sinks into your head. 
and then you do the real thing. That's what I suggest. But if you're afraid of making mistakes, which is what these people, like my poor dad, are, <gasps> what if I make a mistake? If I make a mistake, I'm stupid, I'm stupid. Well, that's what's wrong with the school system. That's what I want traditional education. They punish you for making mistakes. Now, you look at it this way, I love flight school. I love learning to be a pilot and getting ready to go to Vietnam. The reason I like flight school at Pensacola, Florida and Camp Pendleton, California was because we simulated, simulated, simulated in preparation to doing the real thing. So this is what flight school looked like. We'd go to school in the morning, we'd listen to real instructors lecture us, then we'd fly in the afternoon. So study in the morning, fly in the afternoon, and then we did the real thing in Vietnam. Now one of the things we practiced was crashing. <laughs> it seems strange to people, but we as marine pilots practice crashing, practice emergency, crashing, emergency, emergency, emergency. So when the real thing happened, when I was in Vietnam, I went down three times, and this is what a picture of a helicopter gunship looks like going into the water. When it happened, it was frightening, but we knew what to do. We were not killed because the Marine Corps and Navy flight skill teaches us to practice, 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 crashing, 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 and that's what you'll learn in Monopoly or the cash flow game by listening to our coaches or listening to the radio show or listening to real instructors who are doing the real thing, then you're ready to do the real thing. So is investing risky? Is turning on business risky? Yes. But what is worse is by just knowing the answers and reading books and not knowing how to do the real thing. So the purpose of Rich Dad was we want you to simulate, practice, and learn. You know, today I'm reading constantly and I'm going to classes constantly, and I'm also practicing, 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 making my mistakes, learning from my mistakes, and doing the real thing. That's the way humans are designed to learn. The trouble is our government and our economy and many of our businesses are run by people who only know how to read and only learn by lecture, and that's why we're in severe financial trouble today. So once again, education has more than one side. It is important you read, but as well as you practice and do the real thing, because that's where real learning takes place. As a set of pictures worth a thousand words, I did my best to keep it super simple so you can decide what's best for you. You see, we're all different. You know, what I do with my money is different than what you should do. For example, because I have financial education, I don't save money. I love debt, I use debt. I understand the tax law, and I don't invest for the long term in a 401k in the stock market. I won't do that, but it might be the best move for you. So again, when you read Second Chance, you can sit there and look at it and go, well, what's next for me? Since most people have no financial education in our schools, most people have to wait to be told what to do. Second Chance gives you the opportunity to decide what's best for you. What one man can do so in 1983, after Dr. Fuller passed away, I had to ask myself, you know, what can I do? I'm just a little guy. But then I realized what I could do is teach the world what my rich dad taught me. So my question to you is, what can you do? Don't you see what one man can do? As shaded as his eyes might be, that's how bright his mind is. That's how strong his love for you and me. A friend to all. As we all know, 2016 will soon be upon us. We have about a year and a half to find out if Rich Dad's prophecy and Bucky Fuller's predictions will come true. Let's hope they were wrong. Yet, as you all know, if you saw in part one on CNN with Wolf Blitzer, and Bloomberg and other TV stations, I did get it right. As predicted in Rich Dad's prophecy, there would be a preliminary crash prior to the giant crash of 2016. And that preliminary crash came in October 2007 when the Dow hit 14,000 and headed down and, and led to the crash and the economic crisis we are in today. The crash of 2007 was a warning. It was meaning, get prepared. Unfortunately, uh, Grunch is not making any changes, but the good news is you can. 
So that's why I wrote Second Chance. There are things that you can do to not be a victim of the coming giant crash, whether it comes in 2016 or a few years later, but it is coming. See, crashes can be good because crashes, like a coin, has three sides. You know, you can stand on the edge and look and say, well, which side do I want of this crash do I want to be on? You know, on one side, the crash will wipe out millions of people, just as the crash of 2007 did. On the other side, you can look at what the smart people are doing, is you can say, oh my God, this is my chance to make tremendous headway. I can get rich instead of get wiped out like everybody else. So again, a crash has three sides. Your job is to decide which side do you want to be on. You want to be on the side that gets wiped out, or you want to be on the side that makes fortunes because of it. See, the good news is, after 2007, many companies and many individuals started making changes. They said, look, we got to do something different. So those people, when the next crash comes, again, be it 2016 or a few years later, they'll be stronger, better, more prepared to do very well when that crash comes. So the good news is, in a crash, you can get richer much, much faster. I mean, after 2007, I thought I died and went to heaven. It was a wonderful time, except unfortunately, millions of people got wiped out because they didn't know what was coming. So remember this, it's really a good time in a crash because when things come down, you actually can get rich faster if you know what you're doing. For example, and let's say this doesn't happen, let's say the US dollar crashes, it goes down. Well, on the other side of it, if you're in precious metals like gold and silver, you can get rich really quickly. That's how crashes work. Another thing, if the dollar crashes, savers will be losers, but debtors will be winners. That's what we're coming up against in 2016. And if there is a crash in 2016, unemployment will go through the roof, which is bad for most people. But what will happen also is millions of people will want to join a network marketing company or they'll finally want to learn to be entrepreneurs rather than employees. So there's good and bad, always three sides to every coin. So let me explain to you what's happening. On page 319 in Second Chance, you will find out why savers are losers. But let me add another layer of expertise to you. So let me get my flip chart and I'll explain to you why savers are losers today. So now don't check out on me right now. I know this may look a little confusing, but I promise you I'll make it as simple as possible. But this is how grunge is ripping off people today. This is what my rich dad saw back in 1971 and Bucky Fuller saw, you know, which he wrote about in 1983. So this here is an equation called the exchange of money. Again, don't check out on me, hang on, but you'll understand how the rich, I mean, how grunge rips you off if you save money. So this M stands for money supply. Now why that's important is because after 1971, they could print as much money as they liked, okay? V stands for velocity, how fast your money is moving. So people who save money and people who invest for the long term, ILT, their money has no velocity. That's why savers are losing. They're printing all this money and your money is setting still. Now what the banks have to do is they have to give the money to people like me who are in the B and I quadrant. These are the E's and S's, these are the B's and I's. So your money is not moving. They really do not need your money. What they need are people like me to borrow money because the only way the bank makes money is they give money to me, I borrow it, and I pay them a little bit of interest. So this is amount of money, money supply, this is velocity of money, and after 1971, they didn't need your money. Now, this equation is really important here. It's P times Q, sometimes called price and quantity. In other words, they call this nominal GDP. The reason Fuller and my rich dad could say you're getting ripped off is because this now, in America is moving to China, Pakistan, India, Africa, Mexico. In other words, our production is being moved overseas. You remember when I was a kid, Ford Motor Company had human beings, you know, making cars. Today, they're robots making cars. 
They don't need you. And where are those robots made? Those robots are not made in America. They're made in China, Pakistan, India, Mexico, which is good for those countries. God bless them. But unfortunately, every time you want more money, P stands for price, they're the big corporations like Nike, like Apple, like General Electric, they just move the jobs offshore. So that's what's really wiping out people today is that you want more money, they're gonna move offshore. And that's what's really killing people today. So if you don't understand this, don't worry. Part of it is inside uh, Second Chance. But this is the equation. After 1971, they don't need your money anymore. That's why they don't pay any money for your savings. They don't need it. But they do need people like me who can use debt. And what the grunge is here is they're just the big corporations. They're not really U.S. corporations. You know, that you think Apple is a U.S. corporation? It's not. You think General Electric's a U.S. corporation? It's not. You think Nike is a U.S. corporation? It's not. So you sit there waving the American flag, but our jobs and our factories are going overseas. And so what they tell you to do is to save your money, invest for the long term, and you're getting screwed because your money is not moving. So let me give you one more example of what's happening with your money like this. Let's say I had a restaurant, and in a, in a night, I serve one, seat, one setting of tables, one set of customers come in. I make X amount of money. But what velocity means, you want to serve two sets of people, three sets of people. And that's what velocity means. If your money is parked in a savings account or in a long term, investing for the long term, you're getting screwed. You're getting screwed because your money is not moving. There's no velocity. So on page 319 in Second Chance, I write about what I do. I'm not recommend that you do it, but what financial education allows me to do is I keep my money, but it's not really my money, it's your money moving. And that's one reason the rich are getting rich, richer. And again, this is how Grunch, this is how Fuller and Rich Dad could predict that your wealth was being whip, ripped off by the biggest banks, our corporations, and our school system. So this is the thing called the velocity of money. Your money is not moving, that's why you're being ripped off, because they keep printing more of it. And if the stock market crash, the people who don't move their money get wiped out. So if you don't really don't understand this, don't worry. 99.99% of the people don't. In fact, the economists in my economics class who taught me, they didn't understand it either. They don't understand this because most economists, they save money and they have a, they have a retirement account. They have to be an investor, a B or an I, to understand this. So if you don't understand it, the reason this video is made available to all of you is sit down with your friends, you know, two or three friends, watch this video, discuss this, discuss the whole video, do it two or three times, because repetition is how we learn. Every time you watch this video, you'll learn a little bit more. So if you don't understand this, don't worry about it, because the economist who taught me this when I was in business school, he didn't understand it either, because he invested, he saved his money, and he invested for the long term of the stock market. And what the rich are doing is to keep the speed of their money, the velocity of their money up. Please discuss a number of times and you'll see a whole nother world. So the people that pay the highest taxes, again, are employees in the E quadrant, self-employed in the S quadrant, savers, and employees with 401ks. These are just examples of the ways Grunch rips us off, steals our wealth, just because we have no financial education in our schools. That's criminal. If Fuller's predictions are true, the next 20 years will not be like the past 20 years. So for those of you who think your job is safe, think again. For those of you who think your savings are safe, think again. And for those of you who think your college education will save you, think again. The next 20 years will be unlike anything like the past 20 years. So be prepared.